Okay, so when we start out, we have to take a look and think about what is going on. Is it volume? Is it gravity? And obviously the answer is a little bit of everything. But if you take a look at this photograph of Sharon Stone here, it looks very much like there is gravity in the, in the orbital area. But if you look carefully over a 20-year time frame, the, the brows really haven't fallen, even though they look very much like that. And the skin on this right side for her has come down a little bit. But on the other side, it's actually retracted up a little bit. And really where a lot of the aging is the exposure of the orbital rim. So we have to think a little differently when we see images that occur over a period of many years and try to really understand what exactly is aging. So I would argue that even though there is a component of gravity and sun damage, a large component that we tend to uh, uh, either avoid or, or ignore is volume. So part of what you're going to hear today is also communication with patients and a communication with each other to understand this model. So I like to say that when we're youthful, we're grape. As we get older, we become a raisin. Why do you want to cut and stretch it into a pea? Because it doesn't look like a grape. A grape looks like a grape. So obviously a simplistic model, but an idea of understanding things. I think the thing that you see today, if you go look in Hollywood, are all, all these pillow faces, which are faces that are way over augmented. And I don't think that's the answer. Subtlety and artistry is so important. So what you're going to hear today is a little bit about how to distribute it across a face to achieve results that I think are artistic, subtle, natural, and beautiful. Uh, so is, is filling a lot good? Well, I use a model of a glass of water. And so in youth, we tend to be too full. And as we just continue to age, it continues to go down further and further. So people ask, is fat grafting permanent? And the answer is yes, it is, minus ongoing aging. Just the same thing with a facelift. Those are permanent changes minus ongoing aging. So it's really, it's a linear loss over time. So if you ask women, when do you think you look the best? What you'll find very interestingly is most women after the age of 40 don't necessarily want to go back to 20 because there's a lot of volume in a 20 year old face. And if you just understand that change over time, then you begin to understand what that concept that Malcolm Gladwell talked about in his book Blink is that we make immediate quick judgments and in the uh, in the uh, discussion by I think Nancy Edkoff uh, survival the prettiest at the DC meeting she was saying in nanoseconds we've already made a judgment about someone else's look and a lot of times I think as, as surgeons we're technicians we're very left brain oriented so we don't see the gestalt and so what I want to do is, is have you sort of understand how do we judge each other's faces in a blink of an eye so if we think about facial shape then it's an evolution of shape. You heard Jonathan talk about that. So we go from a very round configuration, and as we continue to lose volume, it starts to sculpt in, and some women like that more sculpted appearance. And as it continues to go forward, maybe with some metabolic changes, there's more uh, heaviness in the lower face, and the lower face starts to dominate. That's why a lot of women come in and are focused on the dominant feature, which is the lower face. But I like to say that 30-year-old face really should be more considered to be an oval. And I like that term oval rather than triangulization. And that's one of the things that I'll talk about in the, in the, in the moment here, is re really rethinking facial shape, which is attractive. And you're going to see that most of my before and afters are all frontal view, because the thing that I've been obsessed with over the last year is how do we register each other's faces. So a lot of times you'll see in meetings three-quarter side views, which are important, but that's not how we judge each other. We judge each other in a blink of an eye from a frontal view. So I'm going to talk about creating ovals. I like ovalization. And the, I'm not going to go through all the details, but I think the thing that I've been really obsessed with this year in 2012 is thinking about the scalloping that occurs in the temple and the subzygomatic region, almost a double concavity, and converting that into a double convexity to ovalize the face. The thing I was obsessed with last year was really understanding buccal transitions so that you don't have this isolated augmented cheek where the cheek blends naturally and joins the lower face. And we'll talk more about light and shadows in just a minute. So here's a lady here that looks relatively wider. You saw some of Jonathan's photos that were wider that he made slimmer. 
and that chin augmentation, I agree with it, that's one of the things that you can also do with fat if it is, the person does not have a significant de degree of mental hypoplasia in which you need a chin implant. So in this case, what I did was I augmented with just enough volume to the central cheek and very little to the outer cheek and some in the chin as well to draw the face forward. I'm only showing the cheek as, as just a, a point of exercise to have you think about this. These volumes are not so significant. You'll see there's some variability in the numbers. They're just meant to have you engage in a, in a right brain fashion after thinking about the technical left brain side. So the, this, la, this next lady is a half Asian lady and you can see that she also is a little, a little bit wider and flatter like the Asian facies and so what you want to do here is you also don't want to over accentuate the outer cheek area so you want to just bring in some of the volume more to the front soften a little bit to the buckle zone but almost in a negligible fashion. The next lady here if you look at her she has more volume loss toward the outer part of the face and I think she has a flatter uh, exposure of the bone and the key here is not just covering, and, excuse me, augmenting volume but it's also covering bony architecture. The more bone you cover the more youthful the face is so what, you, what I did here is I gave her a little bit more volume blended across the outer face and a little bit into the buckle zone so that there's more harmony going down and we'll revisit this face toward the end of the lecture. This lady here if you look at her she's got uh, similarly, uh, quite a bit of volume loss toward the central and outer part of the face and I think that if you add some harmony by adding volume to the outer face and then a little bit down into the subzygomatic zone you create a better transition from mid face into your lower face. So softening transitions of the face is very, very important. This lady here has quite a bit of volume loss to the outer face where you're seeing that the whole face starts to narrow and, and draw inward. So I think that when you're looking at the buckle area, you want to put a decent amount in there. And the 2.5 you're seeing is the volume that's going in that subzygomatic region, just a little bit more laterally in the buckle area. Um, so this is just to have that ovalization component of the face. The next lady here, I think she's even more volume, volume depleted in the, in the lower mid face and the lower mid face being the buckle zone or more specifically in her case the area that's below the arch right here and if you start to see that and you can give volume in the right places you create I think a more aesthetically ovalized face that's more aesthetic. Next lady here is very similar. I think she's even more volume depleted in certain respects and a little bit more toward the central buckle zone here arching out to the side. Sorry, her hair is covering a little bit on that. Um, and you can see that I've, I've given her more volume in that area. And again, these numbers are not meant for you to scribble them down and re remember them, but to give you an idea of proportion. A lot of things that I'm trying to do here is not just an absolute number, but how those areas dovetail to one another. And this lady clearly is even more extreme in certain respects, so I put more volume in there to create more blending in all the areas, even in the area with that extra one you're seeing, which is right near the uh, near the mouth which is more of, almost like loss of dentition because that may be a way for you to understand the blink effect if you take a look at this photo this is a lady that had fat grafting done relatively younger this is a five year result 37 and 42 this is my patient at 42 and this is her identical twin sister on the left who has not never had anything done she doesn't believe in cosmetic enhancement and if you look at just without trying to study the face, just look at the face from that right brain perspective. In a blink of an eye, your brain sort of registers that she just looks a little bit younger. Both of them are in their early 40s. There isn't any degree of facial laxity. There isn't anything that you would blame. But let's say she came to you for cosmetic enhancement and you said you wanted to help her. You may think, well, she made some mini facelifts. She may need the folds done. Maybe she needs a little lip enhancement. Maybe a a tiny brow lift or something of that nature. But if you take a look, her jawline may be even straighter. There's a little bit, I don't know if this photo is very clear, but there's a little bit more sag here. The nasolabial grooves are about the same. The lips may be painted a little bit thicker than hers. She has almost no lips. Her brows are slightly higher arch, maybe the way her facial expression is working or the way she's painted her brow. But all those things are not the reasons that she looks slightly older. And the reason I would argue is that the cheek shape and the volume loss across the outer cheek versus this cheek shape and this anterior chin bone exposure which we'll talk about more in a moment and this anterior chin hol uh, sorry, fullness versus hollowness and the bone exposure and flattening versus the convexity allows her after five years after a single fat transfer to look like she did when she was 32. So this is that blink effect. 
And if we start to fail to think about blink and we just think as technicians, we get better results, but we don't have results and necessarily have an appeal to them. So this is what also when I'm sculpting faces, whether it's fat or whether it's fillers, I always come back and draw my face to the front and look again. So like if I'm sculpting from the side, whether it's fat or fillers, I'll come back to the front and look because that's how people see each other. Otherwise, if you over augment the mandible and you go back to the front view, you get something that looks blared out. Or you do the temple and then it looks great as a lateral view and you come from the front view and it looks too much. So something to keep in mind. Does fat last? That's the, that's the question that everyone asks, right? I mean, is it just a filler? Is it an extended filler? And the thing that I thought about is when I was setting for the hairboards is that fat is very analogous, in my opinion, to how hair transplants work. Because hair transplants are permanent, but they also, you lose continued hair. So you have to replace the, the hairs. Uh, but the ones that you place have a different genetic predisposition because they are, have a, a hardiness and retention. And we're going to talk about that more in a moment in terms of fat having that tenacity. But fat, a lot of people say, hey, you know, we should be putting fat in every two or three months until it tops off. And what I see, if you really start studying your photographs over a period of months and years, you will see the evolution of change of fat transfer over the period of time. So when I'm, you're looking at hair restoration, you initially get this primary secondary inosculation and neovascularization begins at six months. So when I started looking at my fat graph results, what I saw was that they go through a, a, quite a bit of edema early on, which could be mistaken as volume, and then that d dips down at two to three months, and then over a period of a year to two, two years, if you just follow them and take rigorous photography over time, you'll actually see that they gain volume in cer certain times, not always, some people just lose some because they don't have the retention, but you'll see this improvement. So I caution you, if you're gonna put fat in, don't stick it in like Restylane or in a hyaluronic acid and believe it's gonna dissipate in three months and then you have to refill it. It actually matures over a period of time. So here's a lady at about a week, and I've got multiple ones on my website you can see of this, where she's swollen, edematous, overfilled, and then about a month out, you know, this is maybe that, what Jonathan was talking about, that still a bit of a honeymoon swelling, that period of time that looks good or bad or whatever it may be. But then if we go to three months, maybe things settle a little bit better. And then it may be even further dips at six months. But if, if you continue to follow it, and the only thing else I did was neurotoxin for her over this period of year, of a year or so. But if you follow over 11 months and then 15 months, it looks like volume has just slightly changed. And I see this so consistently. If you're doing good, good fat, fat grafting, because fat grafting obviously can be done so that you don't have um, that retention. So the other thing I want to, the, the, the take home message I really want to drive to you today is understanding gestalt, of looking at the big picture, of really seeing how light and shadows play on a face. And if you don't understand this, I think we, we'll start to look at the mechanistic way of, of seeing the face, which is just sag, 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 or a fold or a lip that's too thin, and not seeing the play of light and shadows. So a lot of us, we think we can look sometimes like Nick Nolte after a bad drunken night, and the, the, that, the, but you have to understand why that is, because light strikes how? Light strikes downwards, and light strikes downwards everywhere except maybe at the uh, Bergdorf Goodman or Neiman Marcus dressing room where it's a very diffuse light. So if light strikes downward, then that is how I take my photographs with very large floodlights in a small setting with no fill-in flash because that's how you replicate reality of how people see each other with top-down lighting. And so if that's the case, if we just lift, if we only lift, that's our only modality of treatment, then what happens is that if the face is deflated and we pull it versus inflating it, inflation to a certain extent done in moderation and done with taste and done with discretion can create better light reflexes off the top light that we encounter on a daily basis. And I think we transition a patient from a, a, an older to a more attractive youthful face because we replicate the light. I hope that's clear because with top down light when you create convexity in the right places you create the highlights of youth as you saw in that twin study and diminish the shadows of aging. So this is just showing you a model of that idea is if we just stretch it versus creating a little bit of inflation, we create the right balance. But this is obviously 
one concept. If I do facelifts, I don't do faces in every patient. I do much, many more fat grafts compared to facelifts. But I do facelifts in people that have neck issues, and that's clearly you can't fat graft everything away. Um, we talked about donor uh, dominance a little bit. What that meant was in the world of hair restoration is that if you take hair from the back of the head that's genetically programmed not for loss and you move it to the front, it doesn't get lost. But I think that fat grafting, when you take it from the belly and thighs, do, does act like the fat that's coming from that area. In other words, it acts like the fat that's very estrogen rich. It tends to retain itself very well. But on the flip side, the negative is that it's very weight dependent. So I think the biggest caveat when you're working with people with fat is not that your fat will go away, but that it stays. And the person that's problematic, especially from the state of Texas where I'm from, is people that have large degree, degrees of weight fluctuations in the order of over 20 pounds. And that is something that I see. I've had three patients in my practice that I just think look terrible, and it's a large part because they gain 30 to 50 pounds. So this is why I'm very careful when I'm dealing with patients either A, with weight fluctuations, or B, that are very, very youthful, like maybe in their early 20s that just want volume. I, I would rather use a, a hyaluronic acid in those cases, so be very, very careful in those circumstances. And so the idea is I don't want to improve my fat take. People always ask, can you get better fat take? And I would rather have a patient slightly under than slightly over because if they're too full, then I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. I think a little bit of, of conservatism is better. So let's break down strategy here. So the cheek I talked about, the mid-cheek area is composed of two areas, the anterior cheek, which is where that malar depression is, and the outer cheek, which is highlighted over the malar eminence. And the buccal zone is going to be the central area, which will then further divide into three areas. You got a hint of that earlier. The chin area is going to be something different than what we're used to thinking about. We usually just think about the, the mental projection or just the pregial sulcus, but this anterior chin component, which I call the upside down U, is an area that really, really, I think, accentuates aging. And when that's softened, and not necessarily to get rid of the sulcus, it's just a bony depression. So again, a lot of times the surgeons were very focused on landmarks. What are you talking about? You're talking about that line right here, the mental sulcus. Not necessarily. I'm talking more just about the general bone exposure. And our brain can perceive the difference between soft tissue and bone. So the goal is to create better highlight in the right places. And when you do that, you create an uh, oval face that's much more youthful in, in shape. So let's talk about the buccal zone. The buccal zone centrally is going to be an area of principal concern because A, it ages you, and B, because what you see nowadays is these over augmented anterior cheeks that look dreadful. So the goal is to understand joining parts of the face so there's harmony across multiple areas. It's much better to do a little bit of fat everywhere than a large amount of fat in one area. So the buccal zone for me is a beautiful way to transition a face from the central area down to the lower face. And the buccal area is further subdivided into the area below the arch. So when you're seeing someone from the frontal view, you're seeing that scalloping of bone coming in. I like to use either fillers or fat in that zone so that you don't see the scallop of arch coming in. A lot of women are then concerned, oh, I'm not going to have definition there, doctor. I love how this sinks in. I understand that. I'm not trying to make them look fat. What I'm trying to do is just trans transition that bone edge into one that looks like a soft tissue edge. And that subtlety, you go, what is the difference? There's a difference. This is why we can read immediately when someone looks more youthful and someone looks older is because we're seeing either a bone edge or we're seeing a soft tissue edge. And that subtlety, to me, is important. And rarely, sometimes, I'll put some volume into this medial buccal hollow, which is usually reflective of, uh, of dent the dentition loss. So these are just some examples you saw earlier in terms of where I would put buccal fat. Uh, and where I would not put it because it's going to accentuate and make the face uh, fatter. Same thing here. I wouldn't put it, in the, there, put it outside, but put it to the center to draw the face forward. Let's talk about framing the eye. So framing the eye is going to be the opposite of what a blepharoplasty is in, in a certain respect. But do you go and you know trim fat? I mean, sorry. Do you always put fat in? The answer is almost always. And do you never take skin or fat away? No, I sometimes do. When do you do that? Well, here's a lady here where if you see, you saw her earlier, she, when the skin f hangs over the ciliary margin, I believe it's cleaner to take a few, few millimeters of skin at the same time you add volume. But I almost never do brow lifts anymore. Haven't done, some, done one in a few years. 
And again, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It just depends on what's good in your hands. And if you are getting wonderful brow lift results that, and natural results, then that's fantastic. This is just one way that I see the world, and it's just a filtering way of seeing things. When a face, when an eye is really hollow, then you add the volume around it, it frames the eye better. And sometimes, you saw this face earlier, I didn't tell you what I did, but I did take some fat away, and I did take some skin away, and I did some neurotoxin, I did some peels around the, uh, the eyes, and I think that combination is, is better in this circumstance. Or sometimes when you're too hollowed out, then you just add some volume back, and you get good results. All these photographs are at least a year out, so none of these are like two months out or anything, just so you understand that. So the eye frame, let's break it down even further into uh, small components here. The, the uh, eye frame is going to be broken down into the uh, medial aspect, the lateral aspect, and then the little bit closer down the nasal jugal groove in this area. And then I really think it's important to fill the canthus separately. One thing I saw in the first couple of years when I was filling faces is that I would have a little dip out here. You've got to access that separately. We'll talk about strategy more specifically in a moment. And then the lateral brow highlight is so beautiful when you do that. And as you go forward, I just look at the A-frame deformity, either from aggressive blepharoplasty in the past or aging, with that little notches, and then just the whole thing. So, and then sometimes I'll put a little bit more toward the outer portion. So these little subtleties are, are what, what I consider framing the eye. So how do you do this here? I use cannulas. I use tulip cannulas. I really just use 1.2 millimeter cannula now for everything. And I, I like it. Um, it, to me, it's ideal. It, it, I don't make any money off Tulip, so I'm not promoting them for that reason. Uh, the people always ask, what depth are you in? And it's not that hard. And I'm going to go through a, 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 sorry, a, a procedure I did just photographically and have you understand that. But it's sort of a gestalt except under the eyes where you've got to go deep. And I think some of my colleagues, even experienced ones, that it started to go more superficially under the eyes, started to get problems after one or two years. So fat is a deep application, not a superficial one. Uh, some points with the post-op recovery, I tell my patients this so that they don't worry. There are top five things that people are concerned about. One is my cheek looks too big, it's normal, it'll settle out. Two is I feel like my jawline looks like Jay Leno, that will settle out. My brows look like Neanderthals, that will settle out. My cheeks feel firm to the touch like rocks, that will soften out. My lips look like an old woman's, that will go away. I can't smile normally, that will go away in about all this in about two to three weeks. So in case you see all this and you're worried, those are things that are normal. I'm ending this talk with the idea of when do you use fillers. We had the hint of this. We're not going to talk really about how to do fillers here, but how do we, how do, we can do one versus the other and how do we educate patients about that. So I think the advent of micro disposable cannulas has completely changed the way I've done fillers in the last two years where I can actually create results that are very similar to fat now, if not sometimes even better in certain respects. Um, the, Language I used earlier about the glass of water emptying, and I'm going to use a new one about the bed so that have, a, have you understand a way I communicate with patients. We'll go through each of those. So the, the glass of water we talked about earlier, I don't think fat is perfect. I don't think it's a perfect modality. So people always ask me how many times you have to go and touch a patient up to get the results. And I say either between zero to one. They say, well, you must be an amazing fat graft artist because you're getting these perfect results with one treatment. And no, I don't sell my patients that are going to get a perfect result with one. I'm going to get them toward 80% and I'm going to do a minor touch up in certain areas with little fillers because I think it's very hard to go back and, or you're going to overfill them with fat. Fat is a soft treatment. And the idea of the face like a bed, I'll talk about in a second, will have you understand that further of how I communicate with patients. So in people that are younger, maybe under 35, maybe under 40, with a little bit of volume loss, fillers are more, more reasonable in cost. And I think because they're bioinert, could even be safer. And I want to just really be careful when we talk about adipocyte-derived stem cells because I don't know if it clearly makes a difference. You know, people always want to ask, answer, ask me questions about stem cells. And I think that if you sell a patient a stem cell facelift, you're more giving them a marketing hype at this point. So, but I think there could be some things there. And when you have someone with enough volume loss and they're over 40, I think fat is cheaper. I think it's more cost effective for them. And it's safer in, in the sense that if their me metabolic situation is relatively stable, it works well. Face like a bed. The idea behind this is that our face is divided into sheets, duvets, and mattress. I know that for the sake of argument, the, uh, the duvet is going to rest under the sheets. And 
I really think that the fat is like a mattress. It provides a deep foundation of the face. It's extremely soft. It's not going to change little lines. It's not going to fill this. So when someone comes in and says, can you fill a nasal labial groove, forget using fat. I'm going to use, a, I'm going to use an off-the-shelf filler. Uh, and if it gets close to the skin, there's little deficits, I'm going to be using uh, neurotoxins, peels, other things like that. And if they've got something sagging, they've got a, they need a neck lift or a facelift. So these are ways that I communicate with a patient that fat is a great modality, but it's not a perfect one to fill all volume situations. Here's a lady that had about 15 syringes of fillers from the age of 35 to 41 here, and she just needs it. She, and this is done with off-the-shelf fillers. Here's a lady you saw earlier. This is just after a year with fat grafting. And then I touched it up with a little bit of fillers to make her look better. And then you can see from beginning to end with uh, from zero to fat plus fillers. Another lady here, you can see this is just after fat. Good result, maybe not perfect. You know, could I have gotten better results here or here? Well, I did. Well, I came back and added a little bit of fillers and just made it a little bit softer. And this is where you see her from beginning to end. So this is my uh, book that I wrote on fat grafting. I encourage all of you, if you can, come to my course in November, mid-November in St. Louis, a hands-on course. Uh, we're actually going to have a lot of, actually, pretty cool, the first course ever that will have 3D HD live viewing, the same system from Avatar, with a lot of ca uh, live cadaver dissections. So I end with this concept is think a little bit with your right brain, be artists, be creative, be thoughtful, and look at the big picture, and don't focus just on the small forest, the small trees, look at the entire forest as well. Thank you.